Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies and welcome to this latest Chassis Sim video tutorial slash episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a real treat for you. What we're going to be discussing today, ladies and gentlemen, is the damper workbook life. And this presentation I gave at Professional Motorsport Board World Expo back in November 2019. And where this presentation came from is that one of the most downloaded documents on the Chassis Sim website is the Damper Workbook. And this presentation um, that I did at uh, PMW was very much the video companion to that uh, PDF uh, document. But also, too, I used um, some examples, particularly of uh, back then of a recent race engineering um, experience I had um, looking after um, the score tracing entry at um, uh, World Time Attack Challenge um, at Eastern Creek in um, October of last year as a hands-on example of what to look at. So, without further ado, let's get started. When we look at dampers, it's really tempting to think of them as black magic. And it's really, really interesting, the amount of old wives tale, oh yeah, you gotta do this curve, you gotta do that curve. Oh, if you do this, the car will do this. If you do that, the car will do this. And a lot of it, now some of it is based on empirical experience, but an awful lot of it is based on rumor and innuendo. And the whole purpose of the Damper Workbook is to take the mystery out of it. And I can tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, to think of dampers as black magic is a complete and utter total nonsense. I'm gonna show you some approximations to get you into the window. And then I'm gonna to illustrate to you to how to use chassis sim um, to refine the results. And I'm gonna show give you a practical example on how this approach was used on a car that produces more downforce than a DTM car. And also too, for those of you who will be competing in the chassis sim online race engineering competition, pay close attention to what I'm about to say because this will really help you, guide you particularly when you do the damper component of the online race engineering competition. Okay, first things first, primer number one, defining spring rates. Now, the spring rate is the change in uh, change in spring force on change in displacement, displacement. Now, the thing that makes our life a little bit easier is that most springs are linear. Now, there is an exception, of course, when we start talking either non-linear springs or bump rubbers, but even in that situation, all that you're doing, ladies and gentlemen, is the spring rate is simply the change in force over the change in slope. That's it, it's simply the gradient. And all you've got to do, and for those of you who are not mathematically inclined, all you've got to do is take the slope, to find the spring rate is take the slope of your, spr of your, spring, of, um, your, uh, of your spring deflection at your point of interest. That's it, that's all a spring rate is. Defining damping rates, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you right now, if I had $5 for the amount of times I have seen this screwed up, ladies and gentlemen, I would have more money than Bill Gates. I can tell you that right now, because the thing, ladies and gentlemen, that drives damping behavior, and listen to me really, really closely, is this little puppy right here, the damping rate, the change in force on the change in damping velocity, ladies and gentlemen, this is your money shot right here. And indeed, one of the biggest misnomers that you see in damping is that you'll see a damper curve like this. And most people think that if you um, simply translate the curve up, you've, ad uh, 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 you've added more damping. And tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, that's complete nonsense. All you've done is added spring preload. The thing that drives damping behavior, ladies and gentlemen, is this little puppy right here. The change in force on changes in damping velocity. And most typical racing numbers are about two to 3,000 newtons per meters per second um, in the uh, low, uh, in the low speed, uh, in the high speed section, I should say, and about, about 8,000 to 20,000 newtons per meter per second in the low speed section of the damper. Remember, as we're gonna discuss very shortly, high speed uh, dictates how you ride over the bumps. Low speed will dictate um, uh, your car feel. Deducing motion ratios, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress this enough. You get this wrong, you might as well just pack up and go home. To quote Mr. Miyagi from the Karate Kid, balance good, karate good. Balance bad, better pack up and go home. Um, and motion ratios are the exact analog of this. If you get this right, everything slots into price. And the reason it's so important, ladies and gentlemen, 
is that wheel rate is motion ratio squared times k. Wheel rate is the spring rate the tire sees. So don't leave home without this. And all you've got to do is that you simply plot damper versus wheel displacement from full drump for from full droop to full bump. That's it. That's all you've got to do. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now, when we start talking about damping, the best way, your best stepping stone to understand this is the quarter car spring damper model. And the reason that it's so powerful is that it's very, very simple, but also too, you can use it for some really great hand calculations to get your head around how things work. So what we've got here is that we've got the uh, sprung mass component. We've got your spring rate and damping rate. You've got the uh, displacement of the body, you've got the displacement of the unsprung mass, and the um, and the and the spring rate of the tire. That's it. Now the beauty about this is that if we go through and do the full equations of motion, which you'll find outlined as black and smudge in my book, The Dynamics of the Race Car, you've got pretty much something like this. And for those terms, I'll refer you to that book. But the first. <clears throat> Um, uh, the, the first consequence of that is it's your effective spring rate. That's your total combined spring rate, if you were going to measure it from the body to the ground, is your effective spring rate is your body spring rate times the tire spring rate to, divided by KB plus KT. Now, that's a great little approximation to get your head around getting you um, into, the ball, uh, uh, into the ballpark. And there's a lot of great little things that flow from this. The other thing too, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress this enough. When we start talking the quarter car model, when we start talking about the spring rates and damping rates here, and the spring rates and damping rates that you're plugging in here, these are all in wheel rates, ladies and gentlemen. Don't try and do it at the damper. You are going to get yourself hopelessly lost. It's the biggest suck you in I see for young players when you start looking at this. Now, there's a really, really handy little approximation that we can apply, and that is if the spring rate of the body is much less than the tire and the mass of the tire is much less than the mass of the body, then effectively the quarter car model collapses into this equation. That's the mass of the body times the acceleration of the body is equal to minus the spring rate of the body times the motion of the body minus the damping rate times the damping velocity of the body. Now, if we go through and uh, if uh, we go uh, um, if if we go through and um, do a second order um, uh, system anal uh, a second order system analysis of this, here's the money shot here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here's the money shot right here, ladies and gents. That is your natural frequency is going to be the square root of KB on MB, and your damping rate is two times the natural frequency times mass of the body times the damping rate. Ladies and gentlemen, particularly for the younger um, listeners listening into this who are either um, mechanical engineering students, Formula SE teams, very young due to data engineers, I can tell you right now, commit that to memory. That will save your neck on more occasions than you will care to, uh, than I care to remember. Because what that allows you to do is it allows you, is it gives you a mathematical language to quantify your damping. This is something that's really, really important. That's your money shot. Okay, the significance of the damping ratio. If we take a look at your typical second order system response, damping ratio is greater than 0.5, that's ideal for body control. So if we take a look at your damping ratio of about 0.5 to 0.7, it's really nicely damped. It's your typical second order system response. If we're taking a look at damping ratios about 0.3 to 0.4, that's great for high pass filtering. So what that means is that's great for when we're riding over bumps. So, and that leads me to the damping ratio selection guide. So if we're dealing with low speed bump, if you're dealing with a mechanical car, you want to be shooting for about 0.7. If you really need to work the tires, you, you want to be looking at about one. When downforce, um, dominates, you want to be looking at about 1.2 to 1.2, uh, sometimes to 1.3. Uh, uh, now, when we look at rebound, it really is horses for courses. Again, in the low speed, if we are looking where body control is paramount, we want to be looking at damping ratios of about 0 0.7, where, uh, where you absolutely need to control um, the body response. For a mechanical car, I go to about 0.5. Um, for a down for a high downforce car, again, just remember the thing about a high downforce car is once we start, once your CLA start heading north of about three, everything gets sacrificed on the altar of aero. 
Um, so consequently, the aero will dominate your damping response. Now, in terms of high speed bump and high speed rebound, again, you're in the bypass section, you're looking at about 0.3 to 0.4. And typically your bypass um, will depend on car to car. Open wheelers are around about, the uh, open wheeler slash sports cars, 20 to 40 mil. Um, touring cars are in the order of about 50 to 70 mil, but a lot of that's also going to deter be determined by the size of the car, what the tracks are, and um, the, ver uh, the and the various spring rates that you've got to deal with. Okay, now let's have a chat about um, uh, what we did um, uh, for um, Scorch Racing at Eastern Creek. And this was actually, I think, a really, really good case study of applying these calculations, because one of the great myths out there is that this is all great in theory, but it doesn't apply to how downforce cars. I'm going to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, this is complete. Uh, uh, this is complete rubbish. Now, I've known um, under uh, I've known under Suzuki for quite a few years, and the opportunity came for us to uh, work um, uh, 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 to uh, work together. So, what really made this car very unique is a couple of constraints. Number one. The CLA was well north of seven, so we are. It is well past. To, I mean, the two downforce kings, ladies and gentlemen, are Pikes Peak and World Time Attack Challenge. They are your two downforce. Uh, uh, they are your um, um, two downforce uh, kings. Now, the other thing that made this car really interesting is the tires. The tire is a halfway house between a slick and a road tire. So consequently, you just couldn't just duke it. So you just couldn't apply your typical sports car slash open wheeler approach to the problem. And that is, you have a main spring rate, you have a pack a gap of about 10 to 12 mil, and then you basically weld it shut with a bump rubber um, that's effectively a brick. It's just some, simply not going to work on those tires. You're, you're gonna, you, you, you'll kill them. Um, so in this situation, the the aero support had to come from the third springs. That being said, it had to this had to be applied in a very very considerable in a very very gradual and deliberate manner. But the key to getting in there is the hand calcs we're about to show uh, was the can calcs that we're about to show you, and that's one thing I really want to ram home. So let me walk you through an example calculation. So quarter car mass is about two hundred and fifty kilos. The motion ratio is about 0.8. And the base spring rate at the damper is 300 newtons per millimeter. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this also includes the third spring. It's a very, very big trap for young players because in a lot of regulations, the third springs have to be undamped. So consequently, the damping has to be taken by the main spring. So when you're doing this in your calculation, you also need to take into account what's going on in the um, third spring, which is why in a lot of cases, the motion ratios of the third springs and the main springs are actually quite equivalent. Otherwise, you'll just be completely confusing yourself. But anyway, so here we go. So working through our numbers. Okay, our natural frequency is spring rate, wheel rate on, um, uh, on mass. So that's motion ratio times motion ratio times the spring rate of the damper. And that pots us out at about a natural frequency of 27.7 radians per second, or about 4.4 hertz. Now, calculate the base damping rate. So what we're doing here is assuming a damping ratio of 1. And this, and then we're more using this as just something that we go 0.7 times this, 0.5 times this, 1.2 times this, etc., etc. Also too, ladies and gentlemen, um, particularly, for you, uh, particularly for the younger viewers here, don't cheat. Sit down, get your calculators out, work this out. Um, I'm not just doing. I'm not just giving you this tutorial because I love to hear the sound of my own voice. I'm giving you this tutorial so that you guys can go away and you've got something solid to work with. Okie dokie. Now, what's really interesting is again because we've got to control the um, the arrow. The damping ratio will be one for the low speed, 0.5 for the high speed. So, converting this at the damper. Remember, okay, to convert back to the damper, it's our damping rate divided by motion ratio squared because we've got to convert back to the rate at the damper. And that is a real trap for young players, ladies and gentlemen. It's the biggest mistake that I see made in these calculations because what will happen is that they'll you'll use these calculations for damping rate where you'll have where you'll go through, figure out your wheel rates, and then go through and figure uh, and go through and figure this out. And then you'll go, boom, that's the damping rate. Uh-uh, you've got to convert it back to the damper which is why I see you work through that example. Again, to the younger viewers here, hit pause, work this out for yourself. 
Remember, quantify, quantify, quantify. It's the difference, ladies and gentlemen, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, um, so, uh, uh, that separates an engineer from a witch doctor. Witch doctors will dress up in a black voodoo doll, uh, will dress up in a, some sort of crazy outfit with a black voodoo doll. Engineers, quantify. Use your calculators. It's as simple as that. Okay, so this is how you plug the numbers into Chassis Sam. So what we do with Chassis Sam is that what we do is we hit one on the dual rates back, you put in your bypass, and those numbers that we calculated here and here, we plug into here and here, and that gives us our damping curve. And a little bit of a war story here, ladies and gentlemen. I had a IndyCar customer of mine when I first introduced um, the performance engineer to this concept of using the dual rate damping spec, and he would, but uh, and um, he would go through and use the chassis sim scripting to run a multitude of options to get a rough idea of where he wanted his damper curve to be, and then once he knew where the damping curve w uh, uh, was, he could then take that back to the damper builder and to the race engineer, and then they could just fine tune from that. So it's a very powerful tool. Simulation work, the shaker rig toolbox. Now, um, my apologies for those who are doing the competition, you're not gonna have access to the shaker rig toolbox, but you can pretty much get a fair way down the road um, using uh, 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 using the damper histogram and looking at your tire load variations. But once the damper spec, but for those of you who got the full version of Chassis Sim Elite, the, the Shaker Rig Toolbox is about to become your best friend. Now here's why. If, uh, what the Shaker Rig Toolbox will tell you is the frequency response and the CPL. And the way that you work, uh, work this is you work, focus on two things. Minimizing the contact patch load variation and the cross pitch mode response. Now, when I went through and did this on um, the Scorch Racing Car, this was the end result. There was about a four kilo um, difference at the front in that the front was better and a 0.7 kilo difference um, at the rear. However, when I went through and looked at the cross pitch mode, yeah, the heave response rate was about the same, but the cross pitch mode was considerably better. Ladies and gentlemen, if, you, if you're screwing around with a shaker rig toolbox and you see something like that, don't mess about. Put it on the car. That is what you call manna from heaven. This is hallelujah, praise be Jesus. Um, or to, uh, uh, or not to insult anybody, you know, give praise to Allah, give praise to Buddha, or give praise to Yahweh, depending on whatever religious honcho you care to worship. This is, uh, uh, this is something that's really, really key. So, what happened on track? What was found in the initial testing, the low speed damping was excellent. Really good car control. However, the high speed damping needed work. Now, a lot of that was there were some things that were lost in translation. But the great thing about it is this was resolved by adding two clicks of high speed damping everywhere. But how, however, more importantly, the car responded really consistently to changes. All of a sudden you had a solid platform where you could, um, uh, uh, where you could, uh, where you where you were no longer guessing. You knew what it was doing because the plant was fundamentally controlled. Some conclusion and parting thoughts. What I've presented here, it's not rocket science. It's really, really simple high school maths. And what we're doing is we're using some simple first principles to get us into the ballpark, and then we're using simulation to fill in the blanks. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a subject very, very dear and close to my heart. One of the biggest suck you ins of engineering in the last 20 years is thinking that computer-aided engineering tools can replace everything, and that's a complete nonsense. Computer-aided engineering tools ultimately are just calculators. What you need to do as an engineer, and indeed I actually think one of the biggest missteps in engineering education was thinking that we could abandon a first principles approach. Now we had CAE, we could just go off and um, do whatever. I'll actually do another um, tutorial um, about, I'll, I'm actually gonna do another tutorial about that probably in the next uh, month or so, so stay tuned on that one. But what getting back to the uh, matter at hand, what you do is you start from some simple first principle hand calcs, then you use the simulation to fill in the blanks. And that proved the bedrock to get that car in the window. But more importantly, the results are repeatable. So at that point, I'll conclude on that note. Um, but one thing I'd really encourage you to do, go through, take these formulas to heart. I'm just not saying this because I love the sound of my own voice. Memorize that formula, work through this example, have a play around with Chassis Sim, and see for yourself just what a powerful tool this is, and we'll catch you 
in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner or the latest or the next Chassis Sim video. 